Now, do you want a bed? Thank you. 
But uh, time again, we certainly appreciate the uh, presence of everyone here today. I think we have uh, a very good agenda on tap for today. It seems that David Brown will not be here today. He's uh, without uh, uh, giving notice. He has contracted the flu. You know, they're always supposed to get two weeks notice for that sort of thing, but, but he didn't do it. Uh, Danny, you've been staying over there, haven't you? No. That's it. Whatever you had, he got. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't care if you get sick now, because you've already finished that. Yeah. Uh, Philip Fry will lead us in a uh, song. And then uh, the Weldon uh, Blake will lead us in the opening prayer, and then I'll introduce the speaker. Five hundred and sixteen. with me please gracious God our Heavenly Father we recognize you as the creator and we thank you father for uh, the creation for the world of nature that we see around about us we thank you for Christ and for the church that he established and we pray father that as we uh, struggle in these trying times to remain pure and faithful that you'll be with us we pray especially that you be with the speakers uh, in this lectureship this morning, that they may be able to present uh, your, 
your word in a way that each of us can fully understand and, uh, and, and apply to, our, to ourselves. We thank you, Father, for so many that we know who have uh, overcome illnesses and difficulties, and we pray for those who are even now uh, having illness. Especially I should be with David as he's uh, apparently contracted the flu. There are others who have uh, similar conditions, and we pray that you be with each one of them, be with them, <clears throat> the doctors, nurses, all that minister to them to get them back to their much-wanted health. Again, we ask you to be with us throughout the, the rest of this lectureship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've been a uh, member of this congregation since 1974. It's 35 years. And Buddy has been here the entire time. And so has his wife. <laughs> the same one, too. <laughs> Buddy has been a uh, dear friend for all of those years. He's... Uh, done many things for me personally. I certainly appreciated the help that he's been able to provide. I knew him, of course, when he was a young man. I never aged at all, but... <clears throat> he says here he's uh, married to the former uh, Burnell Littles. I mean, she's still Burnell, but uh, 44 years. And that's all of them. That's all the years. That's all the years, yeah. Yeah, all been good ones. All been good ones. Two, two children, four grandchildren. He's a BS in industrial engineering. He's a retired salesman. I don't believe that. Salesmen never retire. <laughs> they just run out of contacts, that's all. <laughs> and, of course, he serves as one of the elders here at the Spring Church of Christ. Now, he's going to be speaking on uh, uh, medical uh, doctors, killers, or healers. Now, he's eminently qualified to speak on this particular topic because, you see, he goes sees the doctor at least four times a year. <clears throat> now, the doctor has to be in Alabama. That's, that's his son. So, <laughs> so he knows about medical doctors. I think you all should see some here locally, too, just, just for balance. You want to be balanced, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's right, balance. So uh, I think uh, he, he's eminently qualified to speak on this particular subject, and I uh, think what he has to say will be very interesting to us. So please give attention. I... Uh recall years ago a old friend of mine and I we used to enjoy going out riding dirt bikes out and play in the mud and uh, I recall he had the bike before I did so I bought one and I uh, got all the paraphernalia the boots and helmet and coveralls and patches and all that and I showed up and he looked up at me and said, rookie. <laughs> so, in a way, I kind of feel like a rookie here amongst all you old pros. And uh, for some of you, the emphasis on the old. I, uh, I kind of had myself all primed up. I'm, I'm pleasantly, yeah, pleasantly surprised because Ken rarely passes up a opportunity to say something about my hair or lack thereof and uh, I, I just never really know how to react because you've all heard all the old jokes you know the the fire back and all that and I they're, they're pretty old and I just have to admit that uh, I'm in admiration of some of you fellows that have these real nice heads of gray hair and looks good on your kins in particular it's a uh, that kind of salt and pepper gray looks good on him. Kind of matches his complexion. 
If you'll allow me just a personal moment, I, I want to say hello, Pumpkin, and hello, Ethan, and hello, Gracie. I think they're watching on the internet, and, and I'm, I'm pleased to have my mother-in-law here this morning. She came out to, uh, to see how this goes. I'm kind of anxious to see how it goes myself. <laughs> so, I threw this up. I think Jack had this quote up, and I think it's so pertinent to our time. That's just a little political statement this morning, so, but uh, we'll, we'll go on. And uh, that's one very similar to it. Let's talk about the medical doctor. As Ken already pointed out, uh, our son is a medical doctor. Uh, I believe he's a good one. He has compassion for his patients. He tries to do the very best that he possibly can to, to administer good uh, medical practices to them. And he also has a keen understanding of what God's laws are in the practice of medicine. It's uh, sort of ironic that the, the practice of medicine has for years centered around the, uh, the Hippocratic Oath, but uh, very often this is the reaction that we have with our doctors. Oh, can you read that? The receptionist says your appointment with the doctor is at 11.15. But his appointment with you is at 12.15. <laughs> and that's a lot of the feelings that we have for our doctors. We, uh, if we have a gripe, and uh, by the way, that one will al also set off Eric, and he'll go off like a, like a bottle rocket because he'll point out it's not their fault, it's our fault because we take up too much time. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm proud of him. He's, he's a good doctor. He's a good uh, dad and uh, aspires to be an elder in the church. And that, uh, that, in that regard, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased with him. I, for most of you that know me, if I haven't pointed it out to you individually that my son's a doctor, I, I try to all, all, every chance I get uh, because I am proud of him and also because most of the time, people hold doctors in, in high regard. And I'm always pleased with the reaction I get when I tell them about my son. And that has been true, I think, down through history. Although recently, uh, or up until recently, the doctor has had very little or very few tools in his arsenal other than sympathy and a, and a uh, sympathizing ear. It's just recently that technology has given him all sorts of weapons to use in the battle against disease. The doctor deals with many problems. This one says, leave a clamp or something in me, I could really use the money. <laughs> the doctor now is, is faced with ongoing technology, rapidly moving technology. He's having to deal with laws of the land. He's having to often prescribe tests and procedures that he feels is really not necessary, but he has to practice defensive medicine. He has to do those things because there might be a rare instance when there's some obscure disease that he has failed to diagnose, failed to pick up on, and then he's going to be victimized, I call it, by the malpractice industry. And if you don't think there's not an industry out there, just watch TV and listen, watch the lawyer ads, because if there's anything, any drug that's having a controversy or any uh, procedure, the lawyers are out, and uh, they're out to, to get the money. So a doctor is having to deal with, uh, with a lot of things these days. The title of the lesson is Doctors, Killers or Healers, but we might use another title, Technology, Tool or Weapon. As I said before, very uh, up until recently, the doctor hasn't had a lot of tools, but now he's finding a lot of things that, that he can deal with, new drugs, 
new procedures, new di diagnostic things. Think back a few years, when's the first time you heard of an MRI? Probably not too long ago. It, it wasn't around. So technology is moving very, very rapidly. And what we're finding here and the things I want to discuss this morning, that technology is, is kind of the background here. It, it's the program running in, in the back because technology is rearing its ugly head at times and sometimes it's doing some marvelous things and letting the doctor deal with problems that he had no possibility of dealing with up until just a few years ago. I mentioned just a minute ago something about Hippocrates. It's, this is sort of uh, an irony here. Most people have heard of Hippocrates and they key in on this one phrase that is in most of the Hippocratic Oaths, and it basically says, do no harm. Uh, in some versions of the Hippocratic Oath, that is not specifically there, although it's uh, strongly implied. But there are some other things that, uh, that do apply to it. Uh, the doctor is sworn to have a respect for human life. Now here is where the rub begins to, to, uh, to come in. And uh, Brother Dub Mowry, in his uh, lesson when he talked about abortion, I do not think that you can reconcile this aspect of the Hippocratic Oath and a doctor that performs an abortion. He has no respect for human life. I firmly believe that if a doctor performs an abortion, he should no longer be called a doctor. And by the way, my son agrees with me on that too. And there's another little thing that comes uh, uh, into play when we deal with the technology, and it's uh, addressed as informed consent. Uh, how, how would we uh, deal with being asked to undergo some medical procedure without our consent? And uh, we'll touch on that a little bit further. Here is a concept that we as Christians believe. Life begins at conception. Life begins at conception. And you know, in, in doing my research, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing how many scientists and doctors also agree with this. They, there's many, many quotes, many publications that will come right out and say it's, it's clear that life starts at conception. But we have those people who do not believe that even though they might understand it, they, they reject this because of the abortion industry. And if you think that's not a huge industry, go out and look in some of the websites sometime. They use some terms that we normally don't use. I guess we're familiar with, uh, with the word embryo. Another one uh, dealing with the stage of development is, is a word called zygote. Those two equal baby. They're not a blob of protoplasm. Yes, they're embryos. Yes, they're zygotes. But they are babies. They are the joining of the genes from mom and the genes from dad to put together a living human being. And it starts at conception, folks. There's no two ways about it. Go read Psalms 139, 13 through 16, and you'll understand what God's view of this is. He formed us, and he knows us, and we started when conception took place. Another one we'll be interested in a little bit further down the line is the definition of death, and we have a biblical definition of it, for as the body without the spirit is dead. And uh, that will come into play when we talk about what, when are you really, really dead? To heal, to restore, or attempt to restore to the natural state of health. And this definition, I believe, binds the doctor in the performance of his profession in that he needs to understand what, what nature tries to do. I firmly believe that we are free to move toward nature. There are some procedures that are out there now that tend to do things in an unnatural way. And 
if we then are using technology to assist nature and move toward what nature is trying to do, I believe we're on safe ground, and I'll get into that just a little bit later, too. Let's talk about the first topic this morning, in vitro fertilization, IVF. What is it? Well, it literally, in vitro, literally means in glass, hence the term test tube babies. In the last 30 to 40 years, this has become a common practice for, for couples who are having, to, are having difficulty uh, uh, becoming pregnant. Uh, and what happens is that uh, the eggs from, are taken from mom, sperm from dad, and they're combined in vitro, in glass. And the embryos then are implanted in mom's uterus, and then hopefully there's a, a normal pregnancy. Now, I believe this is an acceptable procedure because it is assisting nature in what it is trying to do. There is a serious problem, though. The procedure usually calls for multiple eggs to be fertilized. The most active, the most healthy are re-implanted, and the others are either frozen or discarded. Your, the, the doctor then or the technician is literally destroying a baby. And this is a, the same thing as an abortion. Now, this is going to come back into play in, the, in one of the other topics, and I'll, I'll uh, we'll cross, or like Ted Kennedy says, we'll drive off that bridge when we get to it. <laughs> there is also the matter of informed consent. What you're, you're taking a little human being and doing things to it that would not normally be done. And then there's also the matter of cost. So all these things come into play. So basically what I'm saying here, if this procedure is done and you could find a fertility clinic that would fertilize one or two and whatever eggs are fertilized, be back implanted in mom, and then the procedure would have the same probability as nature, then I believe we're on safe ground and a Christian doctor and a Christian couple can practice this. But, man, that's the big but or if there are no discarded embryos. Now, the reason they do so many is because they're playing the odds and they're, uh, they, in effect, are destroying small human beings. So can the Christian then practice this? Yes, under these conditions. And uh, I, I think if a Christian couple is needing help in this area, they need to make it clear to the clinic that they do not or will not tolerate discarded embryos. Well, since we're able to take eggs and sperm and put them together, we can do some other things. We can take eggs out of mom, sperm from dad, and put them somewhere else. And hence the, the, uh, the practice of surrogacy where you can take those eggs and put them in another woman and then gestation occurs. Now, think about this a little bit. What kind of problems does that cause? You know, again, I want to say this. Technology lets us do a lot of things. And there are a lot of people out there are going to do a lot of things because they can. They're interested in, you know, let's see whether we can make this happen. And they can. So surrogacy is practiced. Now, what about some of the problems associated with it? Well, first of all, if a mom is going to give birth or carry a child and give birth to it, do you not think there's going to be an emotional attachment there? So we've already heard court cases where the surrogate mom has refused to give up the baby. They've entered into a contract to do this for a couple, but when the time comes, they, they don't want to carry through with the con contract. What happens if there's a birth defect? Who is responsible for that child? What happens if there is a divorce involved? And we've heard cases of that already where the uh, couple contracts 
with a surrogate, and before the contract is fulfilled, the couple divorces. Who gets the child? What about the homosexual couple? The, uh, I think uh, Jess talked about, he, he made the statement, well, no homosexual couple has ever given birth, and they haven't. But this is the way of getting around that. And we're hearing cases where lesbian couples will, or men couples, will contract to have a baby and bring that, that baby into a homosexual home. There's a lot of problems here. I don't think we as Christians should have anything to do with this. Leave it alone. You can go back and see there's one, uh, one recount of uh, surrogacy in the Old Testament with, uh, with Abraham. Go back and read the problems associated with that. It, then, I'm saying, is not God's plan. It, that, that's something we want to stay, stay away from. Okay, in the news, stem cell research. And if you haven't heard about this, you had your head in the sand. Stem cells, what are they? Well, they're the basic building blocks of us. They're capable of self-renewal and differentiating into many cell types. Just stop and think about this just a minute. If you've ever seen any of the diagrams or the videos of the of the newly fertilized egg and how it divides. Well, there's a very few cells there to start off with. Well, how do we arrive at having 200 different types of cells in our bodies? Well, the early cells are stem cells, and they can differentiate into all types of cells. Now, there's a couple of different types. There are embryonic stem cells, which are totipotent. I believe I've got that word right, and I think we can understand that. They're all potential. They can, they can differentiate into any kind of cell in our body. Further on down the line, though, we find that there are adult stem cells. They are multipotent. They can sometimes, for instance, you can find a, a, a cell that's capable of becoming a blood cell or might be capable of becoming a bone cell, but it would not have the capability of becoming a brain cell. And that's a shame, because there's some of us who need a lot of those. So and we can figure out how to do that. But here's the rub. What are the sources of embryos for this research? Well, remember we talked about those discarded embryos? from in, vert, in vitro fertilization, there they are. These folks want to use those. Well, you might say, they're going to throw them away anyway. Is that not a classic case of the, uh, the end justifying the means, or the means justifying the end, however it goes? Well, I'm saying that a Christian cannot condone embryonic stem cell research. It is wrong because they're destroying babies when they do it. What about aborted fetuses? Well, they're going to throw those away too, right? But where do they come from? Abortion. So I'm saying this is something that we morally and politically need to be 100% against. Now, I threw this up here. I know you can't read this, but <coughs> it kind of violates the rules of projection. Uh, of projection. But essentially what we're doing here is coming down to the lower left-hand corner, and there is an embryo formed in this process of creating stem cells for therapeutic cloning. And again, the Christian needs to be against this because an embryo is being formed. We cannot condone this, and a Christian doctor cannot participate in this. There are lots of pros and cons to this whole process. We have, well, we talk about balance all the time. How do we, how do we balance all these things? We have to balance the law. We have to balance our beliefs and values. And... I think the thing, and, and again, you probably can't see this, but on the left-hand side is 
His uh, title says adult stem cells. I believe we're free to go and use those, use adult stem, stem cells in the research because, well, we might ask you, well, what, what's the purpose of all of this? <coughs> what we're beginning to find out, and this is fairly early in, in the research, but uh, many researchers assume that once we get a handle on how these things work, we can possibly use stem cells to regenerate things such as a broken spinal cord, a defective heart, a defective liver, because these stem cells have the ability to regenerate these themselves and to go back and be therapy for various maladies. Thankfully, new research is moving toward adult stem cells. <coughs> me. Many researchers are beginning to, uh, to find that adult stem cells can be processed in such that they revert back into earlier stages. And they're finding that doing the proper procedures we don't need the embryonic stem cells to accomplish the same thing that can be accomplished with adult stem cells. And there is an advantage to adult stem cells in that if a procedure is designed to help a specific patient, for instance, if one of you might have a, a blood disease of some sort, and we find that a stem cell procedure can treat that blood disorder by taking stem cells from you and doing that procedure, you don't have a rejection problem. It's your own stuff that's being used. And there's a tremendous amount of potential there, and, and thankfully we're moving in that direction. Here's something I firmly believe. When you talk about stem cells and embryonic stem cells, there are many who go back to the what I stated before. They want to use the unused embryos and aborted fetuses. And it is my opinion that the folks that want to minimize the value of aborted fetuses and unused embryos are doing that because it ties into the abortion rights. If these two things are throwaways, then abortion is okay. We're just throwing away a blob of protoplasm. And we know that that is not true. So I think this is all intertwined here when they say, well, let's use these, these aborted fetuses. They are of no value. And it comes back to the value that we place on human life. Well, now we're, we have the technology. Let's talk about cloning just for a minute. Cloning, to make an exact duplicate. Notice I underlined the word exact. Let's look at it just a bit. Hello, Dolly. Or if you prefer, here's Dolly. Back in... Let's see, when, when was the date for that? 90, 95, I think. I have it. It's, it's in the manuscript. It, 97, there you go. Uh, actually, she was born, I believe, in 96. But the publications didn't come out until February of 97, I think. But anyway, that, that's not of all that, all that important. She was born in July 96 in February of 97. She made her debut. So, why did it make such a splash? Because there had been clones done before, frogs and things like that, but lo and behold, now we have a mammal that has very similar physiology to the human. So that got the world's attention. We were able to do, to create Dolly. Maybe you read in the news lately that there are some, some clinics, some veterinary clinics now are offering to uh, clone your pet. For a mere $50,000, they will clone your, your treasured pet so that uh, you'll have one or more of them. 
Well, it's sort of ironic. That's two of our little girls here. They didn't appear real happy about this picture. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting that true clones are made by nature, by God's nature, when he creates what we call identical twins. Uh, Jeff was telling me that uh, these two girls, they even had some tests done, and the DNA just tracks identical. One interesting thing you might... Uh, might note is that uh, they'll be identical until environmental things and, and training and different habits start uh, changing them some because you can't see some differences here. But one thing will be different is their fingerprints. They won't have the same fingerprints. You know, well, you know this or not too, even kids, if uh, you have your kids fingerprinted, you need to have them finally fingerprinted after they're 14 years old because they'll change. It keeps changing until they get about 14. Anyway, that won't cost you anything extra. Why clone? Well, you can see the advantages of it, uh, particularly as, uh, let's talk about animal husbandry. If uh, uh, we had uh, one of Lynn Parker's milk cows and, and it was a real producer, well, you can go through the genetics and, and try to, uh, to, to make the line go in that direction, but how about just taking that cow and just cloning her? And you've got a, a whole herd of top producers. Well, what else, what, where else might it pop up? How about in humans? Let's clone the, the brightest and the best. Just think about that just for a minute. Here. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry he's not here, so I could pick on him a little bit. But, you know, that's got to be the liberal's worst nightmare. <laughs> Just think. Clones. Now, we'll talk about some of the problems in just a minute, but I, I want to tell you right up front. Cloning can go terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> What are the problems? Well, first of all, and this closes the door as far as we're concerned, there's no biblical authority for such reproduction. We can't do it. But let's look at it from, quote, a, a secular point of view. Again, we're going to have multiple embryos produced. It is almost certain that there will be miscarriages and deformities there were 277 eggs removed from the donor of Dolly. Of those 277, 29 were fertilized that actually went through the process and, and became fertilized. Of those 29, one survived, and that was Dolly. Now, translate this over into to humans. 277, 29, down to 1. We, in effect, at least out of those 29, 28 of them are, are in, a, in effect abortions. We don't have the right to do that. Now, again, this little thing about informed consent. What happens when we're taking a little bitty human being and subjecting them to the experimentation that's going to be needed to do this. Have they consented? No, they haven't. Now, will it happen? I think it will. There's going to be some people out there. In fact, some have claimed attempts to clone humans already. I, this is just a guess on my part, but I, I'm reasonably certain it's been tried it has failed. We just don't know about it. We haven't been told about it because there's going to be a tremendous uproar. There are some good folks out there that see the, the pitfalls of this. 
Another interesting thing that, uh, that came up with Dolly is that uh, Dolly, that, let me back up a little bit. The normal lifespan of a sheep is about 12 years. Dolly was cloned from a six-year-old sheep. Dolly lived to be six years old. So I asked the question, is there really a biological clock running? I think there is. Because I want to go back to my definition, Ray. I underlined exact. Right now, cloning will produce an exact as best that we can tell. But you know, we sing a song uh, about uh, God holding the seed within his hand. My personal opinion is that there's some things we're never going to be able to do because he holds the key. And I don't think he's going to trust us with some of these keys, no matter how technology goes. You know, uh, talking about technology, we uh, some of us, I guess, get dragged kicking and screaming into technology. I got to take a <laughs> Dub said his reaction to technology wasn't real good to start off with. He said he told Wilbur and he told Orville that thing will never fly. And uh, <laughs> genetic counseling. Well, we have all this great technology now. What can we do? We can go and, and look at the genetics of a prospective offspring and get an idea of what the probabilities are of them having some sort of genetic disease. For instance, we've got some pretty good protectors uh, for uh, sickle cell anemia, for Down syndrome. So we can beforehand, before a pregnancy even starts, to give a couple the, and a estimate of the probability of these things happening. So what does this do? Well, first of all, it lets the couple make a dec decision whether or not to try to have a child. If they decide to do it, then they know what they're getting into. By the way, uh, this, there, this popped up in the news with Sarah Palin. You know, how dare she give birth to a Down syndrome child? Boy, I applaud her. I really do. So, beforehand, I think it's good before the pregnancy occurs. The problem comes in that if it is during the pregnancy, it can be good to let a couple know that, yes, you're going to have a Down syndrome child and be prepared for it. And get, get your plans put in place and, and do whatever you can medically to take care of that child. The bad thing comes that they say, you're going to have a Down syndrome child aboard it. And that's going to happen with this too. So what we're seeing then is, is technology can be good on one side and can be bad on the other. The doctor can be a healer and a counselor, but he can be a killer too because he can recommend that that couple perform an abortion, and then there's that doctor who will perform the abortion. Okay. Lastly, that a lot of us in the building need to be concerned with is euthanasia. Get rid of the old folks. Well, that's not always what it means. It, uh, it, its root word is well death. Well, we understand that suicide is prohibited for the Christian. And that has played into it. If you read the news accounts, there's assisted suicide and all of that, and this kind of comes under the heading of euthanasia. So what we really have done is changed the, the root meaning of the word to mean intentional action or omission for the good of the dependent, for the patient. Well, let's talk about this just a minute. Who defines good? If you're laying in, in the hospital bed with a, quote, terminal illness, who decides whether it's your, turn, your time to go? Is it good for you? Is it good for your family? Is it good for the Medicare business? 
folks, it's coming. It's coming. You're going to have to, in fact, that, I think I understand it's part of this, quote, stimulus bill. If there's going to be a medical database and, and all of this, and uh, when uh, uh, we get old and we don't have, quote, any more useful life, we're going to be denied certain treatments. So whose good is it? Who defines death? This is a, a problem also. Uh, what, what is death? Is it brain dead? Is it physiological death? Is your heart stop? Uh, you know, back a few years ago, there weren't defibrillators all around. And you fell out and had a heart attack, you're gone. Now, put the paddles, bang. You're back breathing and heart beating again. Was he dead? There are a lot of questions involved in this, and I, I don't know that I have the answers, but we need to give it some thought. And then, then the question comes about, what about pain? Oh, well, we're just going to pull the plug on him because he's in such pain. Well, there are those good doctors, I think, that understand that pain can be dealt with. And ironically, one of the the problems that needs to be dealt with is depression. We very often find that uh, that patients who desire to, to die and even those who desire assisted suicide are really dealing with depression. And if the doctor helps them deal with that, we find that they can go on and lead some more uh, life with some quality to it. There's no easy answers. But I think there are some things that need to come into play, and the good doctor, the healer doctor, is going to have a respect for life. And then there's one that, uh, that I think we should apply. I think David, uh, David Brown said this when they were trying to make the decision of what, uh, what course of action to take with his dad. And they knew he was terminally ill, he was in a coma, administering a lot of drugs. And someone just posed the question, why slow him down from going to heaven? So that's a factor that I think comes into play for us as Christians. Plan for it. I'm suggesting that we all do this. And this, uh, my son is a firm believer in this too. Execute a medical power of attorney. Talk to some people. And you better be some, somebody that you trust so you don't want to have somebody making the decision that's going to inherit your million dollar estate, get a medical power of attorney. In this case, we are really, really fortunate to having a doctor because I, the, our doctor is going to help with that decision. Make a living will. Define what you call heroics. You know, a lot of times we'll say, what, uh, I don't want, want you trying to keep me alive with heroic measures. Well, what's heroic? Is it the paddles with a, uh, the defibrillator? Is it a machine that's going to breathe for you for years and years? So there's a lot of questions there. Do, do you need to execute a do not resuscitate order? I, I'd encourage you all to look into this, uh, particularly as you, as you get a bit older. Well, one thing I've got an answer to, how to have a well death. You want to know what it is? Thank you. I was going to say if you uh, needed somebody that, uh, uh, you know, a trusted friend or something like that to make a determination whether to resuscitate you, just, just uh, I'll do it. <clears throat> I just want the password to your bank account to see what the balance is before we do all this. <laughs> you know, when Lynn Parker was here, we, we had the, uh, the ability to resuscitate people. It just, just kind of imagine this, if you're, if you're out laying out and, and you need to be resuscitated and you open your eyes and he's about to give you mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, <clears throat> that'll shock you back into life. <laughs> <laughs> he might he might just decide to go ahead and end it right there. 
but I, I, I think you can see that uh, Eric you know, uh, has trained Buddy well. Uh, there are many, many considerations that a Christian doctor must uh, uh, think about in order to be a Christian doctor. Uh, there are many unscrupulous doctors out there, as any, in any other profession for that matter. But I do believe that there are a lot of doctors out there that uh, are at least abiding by Christian principles and that they will not engage in these sorts of activities. We, we need to support them and be thankful that there are those that are out there. All good things to consider. Uh, appreciate it very much, buddy. Uh, let's be a journey.